Last week was one of the worst weeks in the stock market that we've had all year, given the recent news that came out regarding inflation. For months, the Federal Reserve had been saying that interest rate cuts were basically right around the corner, with Jerome Powell even saying that they anticipate at least three cuts in 2024. The reason for this was because data was showing that inflation was finally cooling down after a rough couple of years. However, the news that recently dropped threw a wet blanket on the situation, with new data showing that inflation had begun accelerating in certain areas again. As the market was continuing to move upward and a lot of the higher yielding asset classes were finally seeing good share price recoveries, this new inflation data put a pause on the recovery of these assets. According to an article in Forbes, lack of improving inflation data from Q1 2024 is expected to delay a potential first interest rate cut from the Federal Open Market Committee until at least July and perhaps later. Monthly consumer price index data for January, February, and March signaled that the path to achieving the FOMC's 2% annual inflation goal is not going to be straightforward. That's because headline CPI has increased on an annual basis since January 2024, according to two most recent releases. Disinflation remains once food and energy prices are stripped out, but perhaps at a slowing pace. For March 2024, headline annual CPI inflation stands at 3.5%, excluding food and energy, it's 3.8%. That recent inflation data may not be good enough for the FOMC to cut interest rates in the short term. As a result of the data, we saw a number of sectors fall dramatically in share price last week. The Dow Jones fell by 475 points on Friday because of this new inflation data, which was in addition to the index falling by 422 points three days earlier. The tech sector also saw big drops, with the poster child for the Nasdaq, NVIDIA also seeing its share price fall pretty sizably. Also taking big hits were materials, healthcare, information technology, and practically every other sector with some exceptions. With this most recent data, it now seems likely that interest rate cuts won't be happening as quickly as we would have liked to have seen, which is going to be a major impact on the share price of most stocks and index funds. And with tensions growing in the Middle East, we don't know how that's going to resolve itself either. If you're the kind of person who invests for share price growth, such as growth investors, index fund investors, and day traders, this is especially bad news for you. Because your success as an investor completely depends on whether you can buy an asset at one price and sell it at an even higher price in the future. And if we stay in a high interest rate environment, or even potentially see another interest rate increase, then your holdings are going to suffer for potentially a very long time. The stock market and interest rates have an inverse relationship to each other. When interest rates rise or remain high for a long time, the market usually falls because high rates slow down economic growth. When rates get sizable cuts, then stock prices soar because the market's under the impression that companies will be able to grow much faster. But for people who invest specifically in dividend stocks, and especially income stocks, this environment of falling share prices has actually been a really great thing for us. Why? If we look at a chart that shows interest rates, we can see that they've been growing since the very beginning of 2022, so well over two years at this point. And despite many of the higher yielding asset classes falling in share price, just like all the other sectors have, I'd like to take the time to remind investors of something that they might have missed. Despite all of this bad news regarding interest rates, practically everything over the last two years has been completely fine for us. We've been in this much more challenging environment and we just haven't seen any significant dividend cuts across the board for any particular sector. We've seen some companies reduce dividends here and there, but almost everything has been fine. The only bad thing dividend investors have had to look at are the share prices of their stocks falling. For example, most REITs have been suffering a lot over the last two years. All of the REIT dividend aristocrats are still down a lot since interest rates started to increase, but we haven't seen a single dividend cut from any of them. What's made things worse is that people have been shorting real estate stocks because these businesses are known to be interest rate sensitive. But up to this point, the only REITs that we've seen dividend cuts in are some office REITs and mortgage REITs, two investments that I'm typically against with a few exceptions. After almost two and a half years, these investments have still been great dividend payers. Business development companies have also been continuing to do really well, with a lot of them paying special dividends and still no major cuts from any large BDCs that I'm aware of. It's another example of an investment class that's still been paying great dividends despite the stock market panicking. Preferred stocks have also kept doing pretty well with no noticeable defaults or dividend reductions. None of my closed-end funds have had any dividend cuts either, and I'm not aware of any surprise cuts coming from any CEFs that don't have a long history of any prior cuts. Also, energy companies, both MLPs and non-MLPs, have kept doing really well with their dividend payments. The sector has seen all of the big-name players continue to grow their dividend payments despite higher infrastructure costs. 
The point that really needs to get across here is that despite interest rates being so high and share prices falling, if you invest for dividend payments like we do, we've been doing extremely well right now. Since we don't invest for share price gains, what we've been getting from a lot of dividend paying investments have been tremendous discounts. This is why, in my opinion, investing for dividends is a much more appealing strategy when it comes to investing in the stock market. If I'm investing in stocks that pay high, consistent dividends that are healthy, I actually want share prices to go down because I'm going to be earning even more dividends for less money and I can choose to retire much sooner. If you invest for share price growth, the biggest concern that has to be on your mind is when you're planning on retiring. The hardest question to answer for people who invest for share price gains and not dividends is how much do you need to retire? Is it possible to retire with 750000 1 million, 1.5 million? This is not an easy question to answer, and many banks and financial planning companies have their own platforms that can try and calculate how much capital you need to actually retire. Now, of course, all of these services are going to cost you money in the form of asset management fees. For dividend investors, the answer to when you can retire is significantly easier to answer. First, create a list of all of your expenses and maybe add some more wiggle room in there for entertainment and other fun stuff. If you determine that you need $4,000 a month, then that means you can retire when you're making $4,000 a month in dividends from your holdings. Now, there are some additional considerations you'll need to keep in mind. You'll want a mixture of higher paying dividend investments and some dividend stocks that can provide you with growth over time to adjust for inflation. Also, if you anticipate a higher expense coming on in your life, such as having to take care of a loved one, then that's another consideration for you. But you can see when you invest for dividend payments and not share price, it's much easier to know where you can retire. Here's another consideration for growth and index fund investors. Not only is it important to get right what amount you'll need to retire, but you also have to hope and pray that you don't retire at the wrong time. Let's take a look at an example. Let's assume that you decided to retire on January 1st, 2000 and you had $1 million saved up all in an S&P 500 index fund. Let's also assume that you need $50,000 per year for living expenses. After all these years, how much money do you think you would still have today from your savings? If you guessed $0, then you'd be right. In fact, you'd actually would have ran out of money back in 2016 according to Portfolio Visualizer. Granted, there are some things you could have done, like spend less money each year. But if you did need your estimated budget and couldn't settle for less, then you'd be right back in the labor force today. With dividends, if you have a well-diversified portfolio of stocks and funds, then you don't have to worry about capital since you're not relying on selling it to fund your retirement. If you do need to sell shares to cover your normal expenses and the market just so happens to drop by 15%, then your money is not going to go as far and you'll have to sell even more shares to cover everything. But again, for dividend and income investors, we don't care about share prices. We won't have to sell shares to cover our expenses. Those will remain unchanged once we're living off the dividend payments. In summary, if you're stressed out about share prices falling in the year ahead, I would really like to suggest that you give dividend investing a try. You'll learn to love red days because they present better income opportunities for us. If it's your goal to live off dividends, you won't have to guess how much money you'll need to have saved up or if you're retiring at a bad time. Yes, dividends do get cut sometimes, but that's why if you build up a well-diversified portfolio, it'll help protect you. That and just checking in on your investments every now and then to determine if they're still healthy. You'll love looking at the dividend payment history in your brokerage account and seeing how the amounts grow every single month. This is ultimately why, in my opinion, investing in dividend-paying stocks is the superior way of investing in the stock market. But with that being said, that's going to conclude today's video. If you'd like to connect and also see what's inside my own personal dividend portfolio, then feel free to check me out over on our Patreon, where you'll receive updates and be able to talk to me and other higher-yielding dividend and income investors. But with that being said, thank you all so much for watching today's video, and until next time, take care.